I don't believe there's a human being on Earth who doesn't experience periods of depression, times when, as far as he's concerned, the whole world can close up shop and go fishing. The experts say these periods of feeling low, unhappy, and depressed are a normal part of living, provided we don't go too low when we're depressed or too high at the happy end of the cycle. If your periods of depression are too deep or last too long, you could probably use some professional help. But we all experience these highs and lows, and I've been in a real beauty of a low for the past day or so. Incidentally, these periods of depression almost always follow an illness, even a slight cold. Well, last Sunday morning, I was awakened by the telephone at 5 o'clock in the morning. It was a man I'd known years before who happened to be passing through town and just wanted to call and say hello. At 5 on a Sunday morning, he wanted to call and say hello. But once I'm up, I'm up for good, so I went to the kitchen to make a pot of coffee. The moment that telephone rang, I was aware that I was depressed. In fact, the telephone had also awakened my wife, who took one look at me and asked me what was wrong. I told her I was feeling a little depressed, and she gave me a very cheering message. If I remember correctly, she said, uh, oh, really? She always has one of those great morale boosters right at the tip of her tongue. But as I was making the coffee, I thought that even though I felt low enough to crawl under the door, I couldn't think of a single human being on Earth with whom I'd trade places. And this seemed to have a good effect. And I began to wonder if this is true of everyone. Would anyone agree to physically change places with another person, to forget completely his own life and past, family and friends, to lose completely his own personality, his own mind and abilities, and take on those of another human being, a stranger? Would an old man sitting in the park willingly change places with the child being pushed by in a stroller? Would any woman, regardless of her present life, change places with any other woman on earth? What do you think? Would you? Can you think of a person alive today with whom you'd willingly trade places? I mentioned this to my wife. I asked her the same question, and she said, certainly not. She said no one would, because it would mean losing one's identity, and that a person's identity is his most important possession. Now, to me, this was all very interesting, and I must admit that it went away a long way toward restoring my attitude toward myself and the world. And the psychologists agree with my wife. They say that the most important thing to a human being is his identity as a person, and that's the thing he wouldn't trade. And now, a moment for this message. Bring this subject of trading places with someone else up the next time the family sits down at a meal. Give it some thought on your own. It has a way of getting us back on course. How about it? Is there anyone you'd trade with? Thank you. Harvey Mindus, a practicing psychologist and a professor at UCLA, is the author of this marvelous book, Laughter and Liberation, in which he points out that everyone seems to realize the importance of a sense of humor and agrees that it's one of our most valuable faculties. Thinkers, simple and profound, declare that the ability to see the funny side of things and to laugh at ourselves and our troubles is an asset of the greatest magnitude. It can help us contend with adversity, derive greater joy from living, and maintain our sanity, yet no one seems to know how to cultivate it. The kind of humor that deserves to be called therapeutic is not the kind that enjoys jokes and comic routines, for delightful as they may be, they're contrived and superficial, bearing about the same relation to therapeutic humor as pretty pictures do to art. The kind of sense of humor that can help us maintain our sanity moves beyond jokes, beyond wit, beyond laughter itself. It must constitute a frame of mind, a point of view, a deep, reaching attitude toward life. A cluster of qualities characterizes this peculiar frame of mind. Flexibility, uh, in this case a person's willingness to examine every side of every issue and every side of every side. Spontaneity, his ability to leap from one mood or mode of thought to another. Unconventionality, his freedom from the values of his time, his place, and his profession. Shrewdness, his refusal to believe that anyone, least of all himself, is what he seems to be. Playfulness, his grasp of life as a game, a tragicomic game that nobody wins, but that does not have to be won to be enjoyed. And humility, that elusive quality exemplified by the rabbi in this traditional story. A wise old rabbi lay dying, so his disciples lined up next to his deathbed to catch his final words. They arranged themselves in order from the most brilliant pupil to the most obtuse. The brilliant one bent over the prostrate form and whispered, Rabbi, what are your final words? 
My final words, murmured the ancient rabbi, are, life is a river. Well, the disciple passed it on to the person next to him, and the phrase traveled like wildfire down the line. When it reached the oaf at the end, however, he scratched his head in perplexity. What does the rabbi mean, life is a river, he asked. Well, that question, of course, traveled back up the line. What does the rabbi mean, life is a river? When the star pupil heard it, he leaned over again. Rabbi, he implored, for the old man was breathing his last, what do you mean, life is a river? And the rabbi, shrugging, croaked, so it's not a river. A man who can shrug off the insufficiency of his ultimate wisdom, the meaninglessness of his profoundest thoughts, is a man in touch with the very soul of humor and each of the six qualities contributing to it. And now, just a moment for this message. The six qualities are the kind of sense of humor each of us needs. Flexibility, willingness to see every side of every side of an issue, spontaneity, unconventionality, shrewdness, playfulness, and humility. How's your sense of humor these days? Maybe you saw the news item sometime back about a Canadian farmer who sold his Stradivarius violin for, I think it was in the neighborhood of $60,000. He sold it to the same New York City dealer he had bought it from many years before. The dealer paid him more for it than he had paid, and that's because, of course, the violin had appreciated in value over the years and because of the shrinking buying power of the dollar. But the farmer sold his precious violin by the world's most famous violin craftsman because, as he put it, I'm getting old and I have no children to leave it to. And by getting it back in the hands of the dealer, he knew that it would wind up with someone who would treasure it as he had. Antonio Stradivari, the Italian violin maker, lived from 1644 to 1737. That's 93 years at a time when the average lifespan was about 30. He worked alone, although later in his life his sons helped him. No committee advised him. No one made decisions for him. His tools were primitive, but that was not important. He put himself into his work. All the world's tools couldn't make up for that. When he was finished with an instrument, when he was sure that his work measured up to his own personal standards, he signed his name to it. And today, more than 200 years later, his name is a household word all over the world. Everybody's heard of Stradivarius, the Latin form of the name that he inscribed on his violins. Throughout history, there have always been men with similar standards of excellence. Authors such as William Shakespeare, artists like Leonardo da Vinci, craftsmen like furniture maker Thomas Chippendale and silversmith Paul Revere. Everything they did was done well, not because it had to be, but because they wanted it to be. They had only to please themselves, yet the products of their fertile minds and skillful hands are still collected and admired today. What is it that causes one person to take pride in what he does while others give little or no thought to the quality of their work at all, do you know? Of course, when we talk about Stradivari or Da Vinci, we're talking about great geniuses, towering talents who found their media and became great in them. There have been many other fine violin makers and artists who took just as much pride and care in their work but lacked the same quality of talent. There are even today many thousands of craftsmen who will not turn out shoddy work and who are proud to sign their names to their creations. They're in the minority, perhaps. They've always been in the minority. But the respect for quality never changes. It still commands the highest price. It's still revered wherever we find it. And the person creating it has gained for himself two precious assets. First, he's built the kind of security that lasts a lifetime. He need never worry about his income. And second, his work is a source of satisfaction and joy to him. He derives deep satisfaction from being an uncommon person. And now a moment for this message. People who set their own high standards to which they make themselves measure up lead enjoyable, exciting lives. Each task they begin is a fascinating contest to achieve their own standards of excellence. Thank you. A father sat down for a chat with his 16-year-old son. The father's a good friend of mine and an excellent salesman, so he had a pad of paper and a pen with him because it's always better if you can illustrate your point while you're making it. And while his son watched with interest, Jim drew a fairly good likeness of a goose and uh, behind the goose he drew three eggs and he said to his son uh, Jimmy those are golden eggs and that's the goose that lays the golden eggs now if you had your choice of buying one or the other which would you buy and his son said why well, buy the goose of course of course you'd buy the goose his father said you'd invest your money in the goose because it could go on laying those golden eggs for years sure his son said anyone would Yes, Jim went on, anyone would if they were presented it in this way. 
But the fact of the matter is, son, that most people have the exact opportunity and yet they invest in eggs instead of the goose. Now the boy was quite interested and he asked his father what he meant. And his father said, in this little quiz I've given you, the goose and the golden eggs are, of course, symbolic. The golden eggs people invest in are represented by their homes, cars, television sets, furniture, refrigerators, stoves, boats, vacations, all the good things they can buy. All the good things everyone wants to have and should have. Well, what's wrong with that, the boy asked. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, Jimmy. It's just that most of them invest in golden eggs exclusively and don't invest enough in the goose that provides all these golden eggs. You see, the goose that lays the golden eggs is the breadwinner. The more money invested in him, the more golden eggs he can provide. Now take you for example, Jimmy, he said. You're 16 and like most boys your age, you don't know what you want to do with your life yet. You're confused. You haven't really been giving your best to your schoolwork because you're not sure you need a lot of the subjects you're studying after you get out of school. And not knowing what to do after you're an adult, you don't know what you'd want to major in at college. Now, what I want you to understand is that as long as you're getting an education, you're investing, we're both investing in this goose. The more we invest here, the more golden eggs you'll be able to provide for yourself and your family someday. And if you're really smart, you'll never stop investing in the goose, even after college. Each year, you'll invest a percentage of your income in your continuing education. And each year, you'll find, well, that you're becoming more valuable as a person, able to provide still more and more of these golden eggs you and your family will want. Do you understand that, Jimmy? The boy was silent a long time, and he said, Yes, I think I do, Dad. I think I do. Now, just a moment for this message. After my friend had had his little illustrated talk with his son, as he told me later, the boy looked at the illustration a long time, then he picked it up, folded it, put it in his pocket, and went off to do his homework. <laughs> I've got some advice here for you today on how to become hated, how you can stir up resentments and ill will that will simmer and hang on for years. All you have to do is criticize. No matter what a person has done or how he lives his life, he doesn't want nor does he feel he needs criticism. This is why a criminal can fly into a rage against witnesses, prosecuting attorneys and judges. Although he may have committed the most serious crime and knows full well that he's committed it, he deeply resents those who by their actions are critical of him. The unfaithful husband or wife will, as often as not, fly into wounded self-pitying rage when confronted with evidence of his or her infidelity. Now, I'm not saying that people should not be criticized for criminal or moral misconduct, but I am saying that criticism makes a person try to justify himself. It wounds his precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and thoroughly abuses and arouses his resentment against the person who, or persons, doing the criticizing. When we criticize another person, we set ourselves above him. We become the figure of authority and place the other person in an inferior position. He automatically, well, he doesn't like us. We put the other person on the defensive, and even if he doesn't say anything and accepts the criticism meekly, it rankles. When the husband at the bridge table says to his wife, well, my dear, you bid that hand like a certified moron, she might not say anything. She might not say anything at the moment, that is, but she'll secretly pray for a miracle that would deliver a sawed-off shotgun into her hands. The other players squirm in embarrassment, and what does it accomplish? As Junius wrote, it behooves the minor critic who hunts for blemishes to be a little distrustful of his own sagacity. The best rule to use when criticism springs to your mind is to wait. Wait a while and try to look for the reasons behind the act you would criticize. It's also a good time to ask oneself, who am I to be criticizing others? Am I really all that great and pure and all-knowing and perfect? By all means, wait until the heat of anger is dissipated. This is one of the world's most difficult things to do and it takes a very mature person to master the wisdom and self-control to withhold criticism but it's the way to greatness, and one of the best known ways to earn the respect and or love of others. People know when they've done something wrong or foolish, and they usually know that you know it too. And when you refrain from being critical, they're grateful. They respect you. Often as not, they'll be much tougher on themselves and make a concerted effort to avoid making the same mistake again. It's been said that the legitimate aim of criticism is to direct attention to the excellent. The bad will dig its own grave and the imperfect may safely be left to that final neglect from which no amount of present undeserved popularity can rescue it. It's a good line to remember. And now, just a moment for this message. As old Epictetus put it, 
Do not give sentence in another's tribunal until you have been yourself judged in the tribunal of justice. The key to overcoming the urge to criticize others is to wait. Wait a minute, or an hour, or a day, or forever. It's as though the American people have won themselves another first. It's believed that the United States is now the blubber capital of the world. Someone has said that if, through some magic, all the excess weight of all our citizens were removed from their bodies and piled in one place, it would reveal itself as a great glistening, quaking mountain about the size of San Gorgonio Mountain, which rises 11,485 feet above the Mojave Desert in Southern California. This mountain of Evoidupois would represent the millions of tons of food that we've put away beyond what we need for good health and good-looking figures. I spent a long weekend at a resort hotel near Miami, Florida not long ago, and sitting at the pool, I looked around and marveled. It looked for all the world like the sea lion house at an oceanarium. It's amazing that human skin can stretch that far. There are, of course, two great contributors to this sad condition. One, our high standard of living and our abundance of good food, and two, mechanization. We don't walk anymore, we drive. Even kids don't walk much anymore, and adults are getting to the point where their legs are threatened with extinction. Weak, flabby, almost vestigial things, barely able to totter short distances under the abnormal weight pressing down upon them from above. Just as the man's life is automated, so is the woman's. Much of her work is being done by pressing buttons or flicking switches. She doesn't mix cake batter by hand or beat rugs or use a washboard or a broom or ring out and hang up clothes to dry, and all of this is good and can add years to her life and keep her looking much younger and healthier if she doesn't kill herself years too soon or destroy her appearance by becoming too fat. A woman who is 10 pounds overweight is doing to herself exactly what a woman of normal weight would be doing if she got out of bed each morning and then picked up two five-pound buckets of sand and then carried them with her every step she took until she fell exhausted into bed again at night. And the strain on her heart, on her poor feet and legs and muscles and tissues is the same too. And 10 pounds leads to 12 and then 15. And before you know it, it's 50 if you don't do something about it. And anybody, man, woman, or child can lose weight any time he wants to. All a person needs to do is to quit eating more food than the body needs for fuel. Walk more. Do more things calculated to burn up some of that stored blubber. But above, above all, stop eating so much. And please... Uh, don't ever pull that tired old line that goes, I gain weight and I don't eat a thing. There's still only one major cause of overweight, and that's eating more fuel than our bodies burn. And now, just a moment for this message. Becoming overweight is not a normal part of the aging process, and it makes no difference if all your ancestors were fat, and all it does is make you age faster and die younger. So don't do it. Thank you. Back in the days of Thomas Jefferson, a person who had read 50 well-chosen books could consider himself well-educated. To give you an idea of how times have changed, take the plight of the business executive today. Within the past two years, more than 1,000 books have been published on the subject of business alone, to say nothing of the massive flow of magazines, newsletters, digests, research report films, tapes, and other media. 100 years ago, the largest college library at Harvard contained 212,000 volumes. The next largest, largest at Yale had 95,000. Today, Harvard's library contains 8 million books, and Yale's more than 5 million. It's estimated that some 2,000-odd pages of print are being produced each minute. It's become a veritable avalanche. Even assuming a man reads about three books a week during a reading lifetime of 50 years, he cannot possibly read more than 1 25th of 1% of the world's books, no matter how accessible they might be. So what's the answer? It's selectivity. As we look at the sum of the world's knowledge, we see that the most valuable thing an education can give us is not mere learning, for that must always be severely limited, but judgment, which allows us to choose and select and compare and fit together the fragments of knowledge we're able to accumulate, the kind of knowledge we want and need for whatever it is we want to learn and do. Part of the solution lies in improved storage and retrieval systems, computerized catalogs, microfilms, electronic indices. 
Using modern methods, a printed page can be reduced in size to one one thousandth so that an entire book can be printed on an ordinary catalog card. And that's only the beginning. Devices now exist that can reduce a page's area as much as a million times so that a whole sheet of data can be put onto a micro dot small enough to be pasted inconspicuously on top of an ordinary comma. And in the near future, using an electron microscope and tiny dots of metal film, we'll be able to store 1,000 books of 500 pages each on an area no larger than the proverbial head of a pin. Soon micro libraries will become feasible. All the world's books can then be put on a desktop or in a single cabinet. The living room or den archive will become commonplace. But the problem of time remains. Even if you had all the books in your living room, reading then would still be impossible. So no matter what system comes along, it's still a matter of selection. It's still a matter of finding what you're interested in and then getting the best books and other material available for your subject. This also demands the kind of ruthlessness the average person finds hard to muster if he understands the problem at all. He must force himself not to read any part of the mountain of material that does not contribute to his real interest. And that's tough. And now, a moment for this message. I don't mean that we should no longer read for pure enjoyment, far from it. But since we can read only the barest fraction of the material available, we need to learn to be highly selective if we're interested at all in keeping abreast of the times. Thank you. It's been said that every man is the son of his own works. One of my favorite poets is Edgar Allan Poe, and his own life was as bizarre as his tales. His own life story is the story of an author of fantastic imagination, a brilliant editor and critic, a poet tender and cruel, an alcoholic gambler, and debt-ridden neurotic. Poe's parents were strolling players, both of whom died before he was two years old, leaving three penniless children, William, Rosalie, and Edgar. William became insane, and Rosalie died young. Far more fortunate, Edgar was adopted by a wealthy merchant, John Allen, from whom he took his second name. Heir to a fortune, he was brought up in opulent tradition, and at the age of 17 was sent to the University of Virginia. It was there that Poe came into his tragic self. He drank and gambled himself hopelessly into debt. He was withdrawn from school, disowned by his foster parents, and because he now was no longer heir to the Allen fortune, his fiancée's parents persuaded their daughter, Elmira, to marry a more affluent man. After a two-year enlistment in the Army, Poe moved to Baltimore to live with Aunt Maria Clem and her daughter, Virginia. There he somehow wrangled enough money to pay a Boston printer to publish some of his poems and at the same time maneuvered himself into an appointment at West Point. The publishing of his poems was a literary and financial flop, the appointment a disaster. After one year, he was dismissed from the academy for gross neglect of duty and disobedience. Poe's marriage to his cousin Virginia was equally a disaster. To begin with, he was 26 and an alcoholic, while she was a pale and sickly child of 13. The poor girl, though she witnessed some of her husband's finest hours, fell victim to most of his worst. His reckless living and squandering brought her mostly poverty and suffering for eight years, and finally death due, it was said, to malnutrition. The bright spots of Poe's life were his days as a magazine editor, contributor, and critic. As editor and critic for the Southern Literary Messenger, he brilliantly tore apart many of his contemporaries and their insipid works. His own crowning work, The Fall of the House of Usher, was published. The bottled and debt cropped up again and again, almost as hurdles between a series of magazine associations. The highlight of this period was the publication and enthusiastic reception of his great poem, The Raven. Poe became a social lion, but financially he received only about $10 for the work. His tragic end started on a note of happiness. Learning that Elmira, his youthful sweetheart, had been widowed, he proposed to her and she accepted. Happily en route to Richmond for the wedding, he stopped off at Baltimore and just disappeared. And now, a moment for this man. Nobody knows what happened to Poe in Baltimore. He simply disappeared and was found a few days later in a pitiful drug condition. It was all over. He died of a violent brain fever and John Donne, the great uh, English poet and clergyman who lived at the turn of the 17th century wrote, our creatures are our thoughts, creatures that are born giants. My thoughts reach all, comprehend all, Inexplicable mystery. I, their creator, am in a close prison, in a sick bed, anywhere. And any one of my creatures, my thoughts, is with the sun and beyond the sun, overtakes the sun, and overgoes the sun in one pace, one step, everywhere. 
Few of us appreciate the great gift of thought. In an instant, you can be anywhere, experience anything through the miracle of your thought. A man thousands of miles from home can in his mind be with his family in a millisecond. As John Donne indicated, we're in a close prison in our bodies and restricted to be in one place at a time, physically, even in a sick bed. But any one of our thoughts can be with the sun and beyond, can go anywhere, experience anything. The more you think about it, the more magical it becomes. I think some people have a more highly developed imagination than others. As children, we all have the wondrous ability to bring interest, adventure, and a whole world of excitement into our lives. Have you ever stood just outside the door of a small child's room and listened to him or her at play? It's wonderful. Jabbering away to his imaginary playmate or teddy bear or doll and the sound effects a small boy can make as he plays with his toys tell you what world he's living in at the moment. As we grow older, we tend to put away the exciting world of imagination, except for the highly creative person. He keeps it alive. It changes, but remains a vital part of his existence. A vivid imagination can be a blessing to the sick and incapacitated. They can travel to the ends of the earth with complete enjoyment, with none of the exasperations and lost baggage and language problems and waiting boredom that is so often a part of real travel. People can be enjoyed without argument or disappointment. It's reported that disadvantaged children often live so much in their imaginations that as they grow older, they fail to take advantage of opportunities which exist in the real world. They wake up in so bleak and forbidding an environment that they immediately escape into the world of fantasy and remain there during all of their waking hours. Man would not be man if his dreams did not exceed his grasp. And the dream, the imagined better world that becomes a goal instead of mere fantasy and escape, can and does become the real world. It's the imagined world of the future that keeps the student at his books, the workman at his job, the wife at her housework. It's what makes the driver mount the cab of his truck and the surgeon scrub up for another operation and the salesman make another call. The imagination is man's most precious gift and it's with us every day of our lives. Maybe that's why we sort of tend to take it for granted. Now, just a moment for this message. Our creatures are our thoughts, creatures that are born giants. My thoughts reach all, comprehend all. Inexplicable mystery. And what you find yourself imagining most is the key to your future. You ever get mixed up with the pronouns I and me? Millions of people do. You find yourself saying, why don't you come with John and I, when you should say, why don't you come with John and me? If you find yourself making this common error and others in English, let me recommend a good book for you, written by Bergen Evans, the country's, one of the country's best known authorities on English, and published by Random House. It's titled, Comfortable Words. On this particular problem, Bergen Evans has this to say. We often hear, he gave it to John and I. The grossness of the error is made clear if the recipients are put into separate sentences. He gave it to I, would surely grate on any error. The construction which is common among the half-educated but is never heard among the educated or the uneducated seems to have had its origin in a fear of the word me in combination with another pronoun. Possibly those who use the uh, gave it to John and I construction had been furiously rebuked or savagely derided in their childhood for saying John and me did this or that. Someone shouted John and I at them uh, or made them stay after school and write John and I on the blackboard 200 times and John and I it thereupon became in all circumstances. Certainly many middle class Americans seem afraid of the word me. Some panic stricken say he gave it to John and I, others use the equally ghastly, less incorrect but more affected and self-conscious, he gave it to John and myself. So then the trick is, if you are troubled by this one, to say the sentence first mentally and leave the other person out of it. To yourself, say, he gave it to me. Then aloud, say, he gave it to John and me. Another common error is found in the misuse of the contraction don't. It stands for the words do not, and it is considered substandard to use it for the words does not. If you mean does not, say doesn't, as in the sentence, it doesn't make any difference. You wouldn't say it do not make any difference. And did you ever wonder why the word May Day is used as the international distress call? It comes from two French words, may day, meaning help me. Another word frequently misused is livid. Livid and vivid are almost exact opposites, yet they are frequently confused. Livid is a particularly gruesome shade of blue, a leaden gray tinged with blue. It's the color of corpses and bruises. Etymologically, it's related to lavender, and synonyms are pale, wan, ashen. Vivid means vigorous, intense, brilliant, bright colored. 
It comes from the Latin word meaning to live, and it's related to vivacious, and its synonyms are clear, lucid, bright. If you like the English language, get the book Comfortable Words by Bergen Evans. Make sure the kids read it too. It could do a lot for their grades in school. And now, a moment for this message. To be able to effectively communicate with others is a priceless asset, and it's one any person can acquire. Do you know that goodbye is a slurred contraction of God be with you? Once upon a time, there was a man who felt he'd reached the end of his rope. It seemed that all the interest had suddenly vanished from his life. His creative wells had seemingly dried up. He still had his work, but it suddenly seemed meaningless to him. Even his family and his home receded darkly in his mind. And finally, uh, nearing the point of desperation, he went to see his old friend, the family doctor. The doctor listened to his story, saw the depths of his depression, and then asked him, when you were a child, what did you like to do best? I like to visit the seashore. All right, the doctor said, you must do exactly as I tell you. I want you to spend all day tomorrow at the shore. Find a lonely stretch of beach and spend the entire day there from nine in the morning until six in the evening. Take nothing to read and do nothing calculated to distract you in any way. I'm going to give you four prescriptions in order. Take the first at nine, the second at 12 noon, the third at three o'clock, and the last at six. Don't look at them now. Wait until you arrive at the shore tomorrow morning. Well, the man promised he'd take the doctor's advice, and the next morning, a little before nine, he parked his car on a lonely stretch of beach. There was a strong wind blowing in from the sea, and the surf was high and pounding. He walked to a sand dune near the seething surf and sat down. He took out prescription number one, opened it, and read it. It said, listen. That was all that was written on it, the one word, listen. And so for three hours, that's all he did. He listened to the sound of the buffeting wind and the lonely cries of the gulls. He listened to the sound of the booming surf. He sat quietly and he listened. At noon, he read the second prescription. It said simply, reach back. And so for the next three hours, he did just that. He let his mind go back as far as it could go and he thought of all the incidents of his life he could remember the happy times, the good times, the struggles, and the successes. At three o'clock, he tore open the third prescription. It read, re-examine your motives. And this took so much intense thought and concentration that the remaining three hours slipped quickly by. For three hours, he re-examined his motives, his reasons for living and moving closer to fulfillment. He clarified and restated his goals. And at six o'clock, under a gray, darkening sky and with a taste of salt spray on the wind, he read the fourth and final prescription. It read, write your worries in the sand. There had been one thing that had been worrying him particularly, so he walked to the hard sand and with a stick wrote this worry in the sand and stood looking at it for a moment. Then as he walked toward where his car was parked, he looked back and saw that the incoming tide had already erased his worry. He then got in his car and drove homeward. And now, a moment for this message. My old friend Norman Vincent Peale told me that story many years ago about the man, the seashore, and the four prescriptions. Listen, reach back, re-examine your motives, and then write your worries in the sand. Money. It's great stuff, but does it make you happy? I read an interesting story in Forbes magazine about three young men, all in their middle to late 30s, who had formed a successful electronics firm and sold out to a much larger company for several millions of dollars, making each of the three quite rich. Each of them was asked by the Forbes reporter, has this wealth and the leisure, the opportunity to now do anything you want to do, made you happy? In each case, the answer was no. I know that sounds ridiculous to many, but it's true all the same. The proof that it is true is that each of the three young millionaires soon went right back to work to start all over again. One of them, in the style of Thomas Edison, sleeps in his lab on an air mattress so as to never be far away from his work. They all tried the life of leisure, and they all gave it up as an unhappy, unfulfilling, unrewarding, and boring form of existence. They found that they were happiest when they were working hardest to achieve the success and riches they finally won and then didn't want. One of them said that he and his wife decorated their home and spent too much money doing it. Another sailed a new boat to Europe in the transatlantic race. Another bought an expensive sports car, but soon they were all back at work. Three out of three, a hundred percent. It should tell us something. It reminded me again of Irving Kristol's comment in the New York Times Magazine. He said, being frustrated is disagreeable, but the real disasters in life begin when you get what you want. 
He was referring to something quite different, but the same philosophy all too often applies to a person and his goals. The other night at a dinner party, I met an old friend whom I hadn't seen in some time. He had recently retired and is quite well to do financially. I asked him how he likes his retirement and he said, it's awful. We've gone all over the country fishing. The rest of the time I've been working in my garden and I'm going crazy without enough to do. I want a job. I'll even work for nothing. Later, my wife told me that his wife had told her privately that if her husband doesn't find something soon that can occupy four or five hours a day of his time, he wasn't the only one that was going to lose his mind. She was going to lose hers too. So man strives all his working career for leisure and financial security, and when he gets it, he's miserable. With the three young millionaires, it wasn't so bad. They could go right back to work again. With my retired friend, that isn't so easy. The answer? It's to understand in advance that we need something interesting in which we can busy ourselves for a good part of our days. Time off is fine if you have something to come back to, something that needs to be done and which you enjoy doing. Understanding this in advance, we can plan in advance. We can make sure we develop an avocation that will keep us in the stream of things, keep us busy as much as we want to be busy after we retire. The story of the three young millionaires proves we need it. And now, a moment for this message. So what's your avocation? What are you going to be able to lose yourself in when you have more time on your hands? Better start planning for it now. Lease your time and people just don't seem to get on well together. Thank you. Did you know that a famous agnostic inspired the writing of one of the most famous biblical novels of all time? One evening in September 1870, two men riding a train across Indiana struck up a conversation. Soon they began arguing about the inspiration of the Bible and the message of Jesus Christ. Robert G. Ingersoll, internationally famous as a challenger of Scripture's message, was trying to convince General Lewis Wallace that he didn't know what he was talking about. General Wallace, better known as Lou, the Indiana-born officer, fought through the whole of the Civil War. He participated in many lesser engagements and then took part in the bloody Battle of Shiloh. Later, he prepared the defenses for Cincinnati and was made commander of the 8th Army Corps. After hostilities ceased, he resumed his legal practice. But the lawyer and veteran of many battles was unable to cope with the brilliant Robert G. Ingersoll. He felt frustrated and defeated when he parted company with the noted agnostic, having failed to make any dent in the network of arguments with which Ingersoll defended himself from the challenge of faith. As a result, Lou Wallace went home determined to write a novel that would serve as a powerful argument for the divinity of Christ. Finished while he was serving as governor of the territory of New Mexico, it was entitled Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, one of the most popular books of this century. It presents the message of the New Testament within a framework of vigorous action that involves believable characters. Ingersoll didn't live to realize it, but the story his argument inspired became widely read even in regions of the United States where all novels had previously been frowned upon as immoral. The book spread all over the world. It was translated into dozens of languages. And when Lew Wallace saw the set for the Broadway version of his book in 1900, he exclaimed, My God, did I set all this in motion. The chariot race, which was famous on the stage, was also the high point of the two motion pictures made from the book, one in 1927 and another in 1959. The latest one cost $15 million to produce and cleaned up at the box office. Within eight years of the time it was published, Ben-Hur sold over 500,000 copies, unheard of in those days. It later sold 5 million copies, and it's still available in a number of editions. But it wasn't just a case of a general hitting it lucky with his first book. Lew Wallace had always written. He began his first book, The Fair God, A Tale of Cortez and the Conquest of Mexico, and he was just 18 years of age. Later, as ambassador to Turkey, he wrote his last book, The Prince of India, at the age of 66. Well, it's quite a story. Not just Ben-Hur, but the way it happened to be written, and what happened to it afterwards all because of a heated argument on a train. Now a moment for this message. Yes, the story Ben-Hur became one of the world's all-time bestsellers, but it doesn't hold a candle to the old book itself from which it got its story. The Bible is still the number one bestseller of all time. The truth is that it's happened to thousands of people in thousands of different situations. But the man who made the story famous, in this country at least, was Dr. Russell Herman Conwell, who lived from 1843 to 1925, and who, by telling the story from one end of the world to the other, raised $6 million, with which he founded Temple University in Philadelphia, 
and thus fulfilled his dream of building a university for poor but deserving young men. Dr. Conwell told the story Acres of Diamonds more than 6,000 times and attracted great audiences wherever he appeared. I'm sure you're as familiar with the story as I am, but it isn't the story that's so important in itself, and you're probably wondering if I'll ever get around to telling it. The important thing is that we apply the principle of the story to our own lives. The story is about a farmer who lived in Africa at the time diamonds were discovered there. When a visitor to his farm told him of the millions being made by men who were discovering diamond mines, he promptly sold his farm and left to search for diamonds himself. He wandered all over the continent, found no diamonds, and as the story has it, finally penniless, in poor health and despondent, threw himself into a river and drowned. Well, long before this, the man who had bought his farm found a large, unusual-looking stone in the creek bed which ran through the farm and put it on his mantle as a curio. Enter here the same visitor who had told the original farmer about the diamond discoveries. He examined the stone and told the new owner that he had discovered one of the largest diamonds ever found and that it was worth a king's ransom. To his surprise, the farmer told him the entire farm was covered with stones of that kind. And to make a long story short, if it isn't already too late, the farm which the first farmer had sold so that he could go look for diamonds turned out to be one of the richest diamond mines in the world. The point Dr. Conwell made was that the first farmer had owned acres of diamonds, but had made the mistake of not examining what he had before he ran off to something he hoped would prove to be better. He would then point out that each of us is like that first farmer. No matter where we live or what we do, we're surrounded by acres of diamonds if we'll simply look for them. Like the curious appearing stones which covered the farm, they might not appear to be diamonds at first glance, but a little study, a deeper examination, and some polishing will usually reveal our opportunities and perhaps uncover our own hidden talents and abilities and genius for what they really are. We just haven't been looking for them. And now, in just a moment, I'll be back. Acres of Diamonds. It's a good story to tell the youngsters over the dinner table. It's the kind of story we all need to remember from time to time and look for our own. Thank you. Let me give you a little known fact today that will increase your effectiveness in anything you do. It applies to doing a job, making more money, playing golf, cooking, raising children, teaching, anything at all. Now, while this has long been known by the most successful people of the world, it seems to have escaped the great majority. Whatever it is that you would like to do better, act as though you're a top-flight expert at it. And if you continue to play this part long enough, you will become an expert. When Arnold Palmer was 10 years old and on his way to becoming the world's greatest golfer of his time, he used to pretend that he was playing in national tournaments. He would even pretend to be the sports commentator announcing that the champion, Arnold Palmer, was now getting ready to tee off. You can take a great many strokes off your golf game simply by pretending you're playing in a great tournament and that every time you swing or putt, you're surrounded by a large gallery and the television cameras. You'll find that you take more time, line up your shots better, and swing more like the pros and less like the duffers. If you can get a mental image of the person you would most like to become, begin now to act as that person would act in everything you do. Gradually, imperceptibly, you will actually become that person. It goes back to what the great German poet and philosopher Goethe once said. Before you can do something, you must first be something. Before you can do what you would most like to do, you must first become the person who can do it. A woman cooking dinner has only to act like a great chef to turn out a better meal. The student who begins to act like a top student will begin to get better grades. You can even look much better by simply acting like the person you would most like to look like and be like. The secret is to get and hold fast in your mind the mental image of the person you would most like to be. Then in every situation you act and talk as you feel that person would. You make the kind of decisions you think that person would. This is the way to constantly grow into a better, more effective person. You immediately begin to act with more confidence, and confidence is the first step to accomplishment. As your accomplishments begin to grow, which they most certainly will, real confidence slowly takes the place of the part you've been playing. Now, your life will not be transformed overnight. There'll be no sudden miracles, perhaps, but steadily, day by day, you'll grow into the image you hold in your mind. If you doubt this, try it for 30 days and watch what happens. You've got nothing to lose. The, the time is going to pass anyway. 
Why not put it to work? Becoming the person you most want to become. It's the trick of the experts in every field. And now, just a moment for this message. Life is much too short to live fearfully, to settle for less than the best that's in us. We can become only what we expect of ourselves. We must act the part before it can become real. As a marriage counselor who's had a lot of success in saving marriages on the brink of disillusion by suggesting that whenever one of the partners starts an argument, the other partner should make him or her laugh. Real trouble begins when laughter goes out of a marriage, he said. Well, one husband says, how in the world can I get her to laugh? She hasn't laughed in three years. And so we asked him, what made her laugh three years ago? And the husband thought for a moment. He said, I think I fell on the ice in front of the house. Then you've got the answer. Whenever she starts, starts an argument, fall down and make her laugh. Well, this made them both laugh, of course, and the doctor went on to suggest that the husband think of anything that might be silly enough to get them both laughing. Stick celery in your ears, anything, he said. I remember many years ago, we were rehearsing a dramatic radio series in Chicago, and the rehearsal had been going very badly. The script wasn't the best. A couple of the actors and actresses weren't happy with their parts. The director was getting edgy, and just as we were about to moodily try to do the dress rehearsal, since time was slipping away from us, one of the actors went out of the studio for a moment and returned suddenly with loud moans, staggering crazily, his eyes crossed, and with the ends of a pencil protruding from his ears. He had broken a long yellow pencil in half and had stuck the broken ends into his ears. From one ear, the end with the eraser stuck out, and from the other, the pointed end. Grizzly as the sight was, it really made us start to laugh. It threw us, including the director, the engineers, the sound effects people, and the musicians, into fits of uncontrolled laughter until we were helpless with tears running down our face. From that point on, we were all right, and the show was one of the best we did that year. Laughter is wonderfully therapeutic. If your kids get into an argument, give them each a cloth or paper towel and put them on opposite sides of the same window with instructions to clean it. No matter how angry they may have been, just looking through the glass at each other, cleaning the window, will soon have them howling with laughter, the argument forgotten. There was a doctor who made it a practice to look for pictures in magazines and newspapers of people laughing, laughing hard. He cut them out and pasted them in a scrapbook. And when the book was full, he took it to the hospital and let the nurses pass it around the wards. You can't look at other people laughing without laughing yourself. And the effect on the patients and nurses was wonderful. Perhaps this is why good comedians are among the highest paid of the world's performers. People need to laugh. You can't feel worried or depressed when you're convulsed with laughter. It seems to have a beneficial effect on the human mind and body. We're the only creatures on earth who can laugh and the only ones with enough problems to need to laugh regularly. And now, just a moment for this message. I remember reading about a husband who, when he had a nerve-wracking day at the office, would come home with his hat on backwards. If his wife had had a bad day, she'd wear her apron backwards. In either case, it would start them laughing and clear the air. Thank you. In a large Western company, the vice president in charge of sales retired. Everybody in the sales force assumed this juicy vacancy and the vice presidency would go to the senior salesman. Let's call him Tom who had been with the firm 25 years, and the one man most certain that the job would go to Tom was Tom himself. In fact, he'd been counting on that job for five years since he had first realized his boss was planning on retiring. And for the past two years, Tom had been thinking about it. He'd told his wife and children, their friends and neighbors, and his friends in the sales force. The job meant a substantial raise in pay, and Tom and his wife had been planning things they could do with the extra income. For the past three months, they'd been poring over travel folders, planning a trip to the Orient. So when Tom was called uh, into the president's office on the morning following the retirement party for the former vice president, he was wearing his best suit and a smile to match. What he had no way of knowing was that the company president was facing the kind of situation that makes company presidents worth every penny of their excellent incomes. He had an Armageddon on his hands. After he had winced at the cheerful good morning and dapper appearance of his senior salesman, he looked him straight in the eyes and said, Tom, I have to tell you that the executive committee has awarded the position of vice president in charge of sales to Bill Smith. Well, there followed a vast, deep silence. They could have been in a diving bell at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. After two or three hoarse, croaking starts, Tom finally managed to protest. But Bill has been with the company five years. I've been here 25. 
Well, enough of that. Facing the other men of the sales force and going home to face the family was a, an Armageddon or two for Tom. But it finally dawned on him in the weeks and months that followed that he had confused seniority with accomplishment. Tom didn't really have 25 years experience with a company. He had one year's experience repeated 25 times. Bill Smith, in just five years, had far out distanced Tom in growth, knowledge, and sales. While Tom was putting time in, Bill was putting in everything he had. And now a young man, but with his head crammed with detailed information on every phase of the company's operation, with great plans for the future, with five years of outstanding sales behind him, Bill Smith found himself vice president in charge of sales. The executive committee had made a wise decision. It was interested in the growth of the company, not Tom's planned trip to the Orient. Sad story? Sad for whom? Tom could have had that job. He even had a 20-year head start. He just didn't plan for it. And now a moment for this message. You know, as Albert Einstein discovered, time is relative. Its only value to us depends upon what we do while it's passing. Time means nothing at all to a stone or a fence post. It can mean a great deal to a human being. Thank you. Once upon a time, there evolved upon this planet an organism that was ill-suited for survival. It could not run fast enough to escape its enemies. If caught, its teeth and claws were small protection. It was too big to hide under a leaf and too weak to burrow deeply into the ground. To survive, it took refuge in caves where a fire at the entrance kept predators at bay. If the fire ran out of fuel, this creature could hurl rocks and thus drive all but the most determined enemies away. Its security was measured by the amount of firewood it could accumulate and the number of rocks it could gather and store in the cave against the terrors of the night. Now you see, this was a very important sort of thing. All other creatures grew bigger teeth or learned to run faster. Alone among all the creatures on Earth, the one we're describing turned to things for its survival. This was, in the end, to make all the difference. After a while, this creature learned to cultivate some edible plants to supplement the food it could get by gathering and hunting. Growing food was at best uncertain and in any event depended on the seasons, which could not be controlled. So the creature began to store its surplus foods. His security against the vagaries of nature was measured by how much he could grow and how much he could store. His feeling for being at least partly in control of his destiny was based on the gathering of things. Well-being was measured quantitatively, the more the better. From the very beginning, he was motivated by fear, fear of pain, fear of death, fear that there wouldn't be enough. In time, this creature's activities produced so much that it became more convenient to represent the accumulation of things by other things, smaller and easier to carry or to exchange. These symbols, although intrinsically of no value, assumed the same value as things, and men, or at least most men, became engaged in the acquisition and accumulation of the symbols of things. They did this even when they no longer had any need for them. The symbols were the surrogates for the rocks piled in the cave against the coming of the night. Think of this system as being reinforced over and over through hundreds of generations and thousands of years through social approval, ritualization, and acculturation. That there was something basically wrong with this may, way of life may be exemplified by the fact that those who refused to subscribe to the accumulation and storage of things, Christ, Muhammad, Buddha, became the founders of the world's great religions. Throughout all of this, nature was the enemy. The purpose of the life of this strange creature we've described was to conquer nature, tame the wilderness, make war on pests and vermin, control the rivers. Life was a battle against the elements. Only the fittest survived. Whole species of other life forms, plants, insects, reptiles, fish, amphibians, birds, and mammals were exterminated, most usually because they represented so-called threat against the accumulation of things. Now a moment. Man's feeling for being at least partly in control of his destiny was based on the gathering of things. Well-being was measured quantitatively the more the better. From the very beginning, he was motivated by fear. Thank you. Someone came up with an idea not long ago that intrigues me. He said, everything we do is either goal achieving or tension relieving. Now that's something to think about, isn't it? Everything you do is either goal achieving or tension relieving. You know, if a man's not too happy with his progress in the world, he should give a lot of thought to this idea. He should take a good long look at everything he does during his day and 
As he approaches each act, he should ask himself, is this goal achieving or tension relieving? Now, we all need to relieve our tensions, but if we're doing too many things that are tension relieving instead of goal achieving, they're, they're going to hold us back. Now, while I'm sure it couldn't be done, it would be interesting if a survey could be made to discover how much time is devoted each day of the work week by the so-called average man to acts which are strictly goal achieving. We might all be amazed to discover what a small amount of time is actually spent in earning our livings and preparing for our futures. This would vary widely, of course, from industry to industry and from job to job. The busy doctor, for example, might spend 12 hours a day actually in the presence of his patients. And every minute with a patient would have to be called goal achieving. Compare this with the time spent by, say, a salesman. How much of his day, and again, this would vary widely from industry to industry, is actually spent in goal achieving acts. Driving from one call to another, even though he's not in the presence of a prospect or customer, would have to be under goal achieving. Stopping for a cup of coffee would be under tension relieving. So would chatting with people he can't sell or reading a magazine while he's waiting to see someone. Well, this is a pretty kind of vital balancing act that each of us should give some thought to. Going overboard in the tension relieving department could lead to some serious problems in the future. Now, Samuel Johnson once said, every man is or hopes to be an idler. But like everything else in the world, there is a time to be idle and a time not to be idle. If you want to be idle later in comfort, it's a good idea to make sure you're not spending too much time in idleness now. At any rate, I think it can be said that the success of a person in any undertaking will hinge directly upon his making certain that the majority of his daily acts are goal achieving and that he relegates to a secondary position those acts which must be classified as tension relieving. It might be worthwhile, worthwhile carrying a little piece of paper and uh, making a note uh, as we do things during the day, is this tension relieving or goal achieving? Now, just a moment for this message. We must certainly carve out our own worlds in this life, and the shape and size of them will be determined in large part by the balance we achieve between tension relieving and goal achieving acts. Thank you.